Greetings and welcome to the Open Minded Skeptic Podcast. My name is Sharon Ann Rowland and I'm your host. Today we continue our trip down memory lane with an interview I did back in February 2016 with metaphysical maven and author Sheila Kennedy. Sheila, of course, was my previous co-host on Revolution Radio's Welcome to the 1%. So let's kick off with an on-air discussion of religion versus spirituality. Do enjoy. I'm hoping that most people are getting um, a bit more aware on how religion is man-made and spirituality (laughs) is um, self-made. Yeah, <laughs> but um, I, I find it amazing how many people that get spirituality and religion mixed up. Do you? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you think, think you know, know okay, okay, I'm old, old according to lots of people, people not, not to me. me. Um, but how, how can you, you not understand? understand? You know, they don't. They don't. I, I know. They think it's the same thing, and it's not until. They have an experience or something happens that makes them question that they um they kind of wake up to it. It's um I saw I saw something a meme today on Facebook actually, which I thought was quite appropriate. It's a group of people staring at staring out like very blankly, and it's got the you know and here we have the fluoride stare, you know, <laughs> oh. and um, I think that pretty much sums up the other ninety nine percent. Well, as a practitioner, many years ago, um, working, you know, with sound and energies and stuff like that, a lot of the work I did was with children because I love working with kids. And a lot of these kids who are classified ADD, ADHD and so on actually aren't from my perspective. But mum would bring along this child who would have the hat on back to front and, you know, the jeans down below the ankles and the arms folded and really didn't want to be there. Where is she taking me this time? We've been to all of these people and she's still dragging me around places. And I would say to them, um, you know, a few simple things. And one of them would be, and I bet you don't like cleaning your teeth. And mum would go, well, that's right. I'm forever trying to get them in the bathroom. And I'd go, well, aren't they really smart? Because their body knows it's poison. And it's like you'd see the child right now. And, and it's like your body will be wanting to reject what it knows is wrong for it. And, and I won't get onto the, the vaccine thing because that's a bit of a soapbox for me in any great detail. But it's the same when we vaccinate people, not only children. The body says, why are you doing this to me? And reacts because it knows it's not good. So we have that innate intelligence. And, you know, we can look at... Um, fluoride and and years ago I belonged to a multi-level marketing company and they had a great video where the fluoride um, truck pulls in and it's got Hazchem on the back of it and the guy's all suited up with goggles and gloves and rubber boots to load this stuff into a truck and then it's put into what we use. Everything, yes, it's it's Uh, everywhere. It's it's just amazing. Um, I mean, the fact that, well, I suppose the effects happened and... You know, people just don't care, or it comes across as they just don't care that um, every day they, you know, especially the ones that drink two or three litres a day, you know, they think they're doing it for health reasons, and in fact, it's quite the reverse. Yeah, yeah. And, and it actually has an, an incredibly bad, bad effect, effect on, on your body. body. And, and on the pineal gland, it calcifies oh, it. Yeah, yeah, calcification, yeah. yeah. Conspiracy theories. Um, uh, yeah, actually, it's from if we were on going on to conspiracy. Do you, I find it quite amusing now that the they seem to be targeting their own people <laughs> in the US. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's um, since really since nine eleven. Um, you know, they seem to have like turned inward and are starting to wipe out their own people rather than everybody else on the planet. You know, yeah, um, which is I just find it quite amusing well I've always found conspiracy theories amusing they're kind of the entertainment of the magazine in a way Um, we've tried to bring fact into the magazine by only really doing 
um, stories on conspiracies that have been proven, you know? Yeah. yeah. Like a lot of the stuff that was in the, the mid-1990s now has actually come to fruition. Um, so we can't really call them conspiracy theories when they... Be, so we changed the section to conspiracy theory plus fact. The Magazine Columnist. A lot, a lot of your, of your readers, readers are from overseas, overseas aren't they? they? Yes, actually, the majority, um, which is a bit surprising. Um, one of the reasons this year we're going to be doing a lot more shows around the country. Um, we've just done the Health, Harmony and Soul Festival on the Gold Coast uh, to, yep. to get the magazine out there and known. Um, yes, I, I really didn't expect it to go off overseas before Australia. So this is our third year, by the way. Yes, mm, yes. Yeah. And, and there's great information in every every copy, isn't there? You know, every time there's a new one comes out. There's, oh, I've got some amazing columnists, and um, yeah, they basically it's uh, it's all barter basically for advertising and links in the magazine. They supply an article. Um, probably the section that attracts the most interest is our columnist article section, and that's um, an area where. Um, it's personal experience, so if they've had an experience in any of our, our, our sections inside the magazine from ufology to conspiracy to natural living to metaphysics to the paranormal, um, on a first-hand basis, we capture it in that area. And um, yep. also, of course, everyone's paths. Um, I love to find out how somebody ended up being like an alien etheric implant remover. <laughs> How do you how do you become that? Um, you know, so I, I, that's one of the questions I always ask myself: is how did how did somebody get to be that person? And it's always um, fascinating. It's, it's always a fascinating story, or they've had some event or some um, encounter that's led them on that path. And that's what I love reading about and love sharing with people. Etheric implants. It, it's, it's actually, actually interesting because, because I have two sounds, sounds for implants, implants and one is for switching them off and the other one is for removing them because you can't remove all, all of them. them. I, I haven't, haven't come, come across, across any that you can't switch off, off but some, some you can't, can't actually take out. Uh, well, the lady that I interviewed, was uh, she was Greek. Uh, her name is Isabel Actibi. She actually works in conjunction with a surgeon. She works on removing them from the etheric um, aura of a person and the surgeon yeah. works on the physical implant removal um, I don't think well I think I actually asked her that question in the interview if she had anyone that just could not have an implant removed but I think she basically just said that it some with some people it takes a long time it's yeah. sometimes yeah. there's multiple you know um, processes or well they, they, you, they can have like, like a toxic, toxic coating, coating or, or a, you know yeah, booby, booby trap, trap kind of from my perspective um, thing in them which is why I switch them off and anything that can be removed I, I remember the very first one I had um, that came out of my body came out from my eyelid and I was um, studying with a guy it's many years ago now and he actually asked um, you know through a process if anyone had an implant that it surfaced and within 10 minutes my left eye blew up like a balloon um, and it was like really really sore and, and I, I was working, working um, in, Melbourne in Melbourne with a, a, a very well-known well naturopath and I went into work I think on the Monday and I said to him at lunchtime, can you, can you have a look at my eye? eye? And, and he, he you know, got, got his light and his magnifying, magnifying glass, glass and he, he said to me, Sheila, I know you do a lot of weird stuff, but do you believe in implants? And I said, yeah, I do actually. He said, oh, good, because see that hole there? That's what's come out of. And the infection, whatever it was coated with as it came out, has actually spread to both eyes. Both your eyes are infected. Um, I'd seen, worked with someone in the late 90s, um, removing a etheric implants from, you know, the aura and stuff like that. But this one actually physically, physically came out of my eye. Um, so I've seen a number of them over the years, but I can't remember what numbers are because there's 980-something sounds now. Um, but one of them is called um, 
I think, I think negating, negating implants, implants nullifying implants, implants and the other one's implant removal, removal. and that they're, they're in a particular program that I teach. Um, but um, the, there's, there's so much, much you know, that because, because they, they can, can be as fine as a human, human hair, hair. Mm. you know, um, they can be injected. And one of the things that struck me some time ago, um, I was actually working with some people in Romania and I was introduced to their daughter who's a doctor and these people both had cancer very badly and I was working with with their daughter to help both of them on Skype and so on and um, I because I'm intuitive and I ask questions and I muscle test on my fingers um, I said to a kind of their parents didn't speak English can you ask mum and dad does anything 25 years ago um, ring any bells, you know, because I, I feel that whatever this is, because it's not normal, um, happened around 25 years ago. And they went, no, no, no. And then all of a sudden her mother said, oh, yes, everyone in the village was vaccinated. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Bingo. Becoming the open-minded skeptic. But there's, there's so much, Sharon, that's fascinating, isn't there? Oh, which is um, one of the reasons I, I, I do what I do. I mean, as apart from being the editor of the magazine, um, I also do reviews inside the magazine and I obviously um, write the introduction each issue. Um, yeah. And I've actually started in those sections, I call myself a WSFM researcher because I think it kind of, sums up what I do and that WSFM is short for weird shit and frigging magic so <laughs> <laughs> so um which comes from it's, it's actually a uh, a funny name that was given to one of the departments in the CIA I believe that's the where it originally came from um slight change of words <laughs> yeah. yeah so um but I think that kind of sums up what I deal with on a daily basis and um you know, and the, the people I come across, um, I, w I was having a discussion just the other day with somebody where I've given up laying a, a, a line in the sand. When I first started doing this, probably 10 years ago, interviewing people and, you know, getting to know their stories. And I used to say, OK, this is the line too far. I, I can't believe past this point, you know. And um, I think it was about two years ago, I met a wonderful lady who was actually a neighbour for many years previously who invited me to a garden and um, basically sat me down and we discussed uh, her her involvement with the fae world. I mean, we're talking fairies here, you know? Yep. yep. And yep. I mean, if there was, there was a line that I wouldn't pass, it had to be fairies, don't you think? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was, that was the line. And um, for years I maintained the line and I thought, okay. And then one day um, I had, I was, um, collating photos for the our day and night watch section in the magazine where people submit anomaly ph photographs and I had two people submit fairy photos I mean very blatant very very you know perfect fairies and um, yeah. I think and considering that um, one of them was taken on a night that I was present at a C5 um, and they showed me on the camera two seconds after they took the photo I <laughs> You get to the point where you just can't lay the lines down. I mean, you've got to have an open mind. You don't have to be gullible, but you have to have an open mind when you're doing the type of work that you and I do. Um, because, you know, if you, oh, told me, absolutely. if you told me 10 years ago to, you know, where the line was or, or the type of things that I investigate now or, I, or the type of people I talk to, I would have I would have just shook my head and now it's just daily you know it's norm it's the norm the CE5 experience well as you know um, I, I do uh, a regular um, we're trying to make it a um, monthly C5 group here in Brisbane. We, um, we don't charge anything unless 
the land that we're going to be um, using um, requires some type of payment. Um, basically, CE5 is short for Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, and that's a UFO event that involves direct communication between aliens and humans. This type of close encounter was named by Stephen Greer's C. SETI group and is described as bilateral contact experiences through conscious, voluntary and proactive human-initiated cooperative communication with extraterrestrial intelligence. Isn't that a mouthful? <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, you know, I am reading that. That's not memory. Um, now, I practice CE5. I've been doing CE5 now for oh, probably about four and a half years. And I've, I've worked my way through a few of the groups um, basically in Brisbane, Sunshine Coast and down the Gold Coast and it's it's come I've kind of come to the point now where I seem to get the best activity um, Skywatch activity or contact experiences when I'm just with a group of friends and um, we do some meditations we play some tones we played your tones and had some great activity by the way um, Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, but we make it more of a social thing we, we find a spot um, then we have a picnic. We usually get there about four o'clock and we have a picnic and um, we, we socialize for a bit. Then if we can, we have a fire. If not, we just um, place our chairs in a circle, um, rug up, and basically we sky watch. Um, I have a friend called Karen Langford who's um, an amazing medium um, and she's actually a hypnotherapist too. And um, I call her a time traveller actually because she takes people through time, past lives, present lives, future lives, <laughs> the works. And she usually does the um, yeah. introductory um, meditation or mindfulness meditation. And then we, we kick into the C5 app that uh, CSETI put out and go through their meditations. Um, it's very casual and that. and um, But we, we seem to get some great results. Um, uh, I, I personally have captured um, a number of anomalies, like little ships and crafts. I think I showed you them when you came to the show, the photographs. Yes, yeah. And um, it's something that I just want to people to start getting an interest in because basically it's a, a bunch of um, peaceful people going out into the dark, socialising and basically meditating in a circle and freezing our butts off. <laughs> but but it's also one of the most um, amazing experiences anyone can have. Um, and as I said, I, it's rarely that we don't get activity in the sky or get flashbacks or, you know, and we usually have a great night. There are a lot of places around Brisbane that you can do it. Um, usually you have to pay for those, those particular events. Um, but if you, I once you've gone to one or two, I would just suggest that you get a group of your own friends together and start doing it yourself. Fantastic, uh, yeah. If anyone's interested, I can refer them to someone up the coast, someone in Brisbane and someone down the coast. Um, they just have to send me an email from um, the webpage, oddityseconds.com. Yeah. Um, or if they're game, they can come along and do a social night with myself and my group. We've, we've found a couple of new new spots to go to now, one up at Mount Me, and hopefully we'll have a somewhere on Springbrook very shortly too. Mm. Yes, yes, that's, that's exciting, exciting, isn't, isn't it? it? I mean, if people are serious about making contact, um, this is the first step. And a lot of people don't, you know, they always say, oh, why don't they pick me or whatever? Well, I suppose some people are just picked as children or whatever, but there's also ways of, if you're generally interested in having a contact experience, C5 is a good first step or a first um, entry point into it all. The Mantis Encounter. Is I have never had a bad experience and I've had multiple experiences. Um, the only thing that I probably got a warning with was um, July, sorry, no, it was January in 2014. Um, I had, um, I met my first, what would you call it, um, kind of a hybrid human um, mantid kind of ET. Yep. yep. Um, I, I kind of think of him as he looked a bit like Lord Voldemort from the Harry Potter movies. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's how I kind of, kind of <laughs> thought he looked. Um, 
but not as grey, more mantid looking. Um, and um, it was the funniest kind of encounter actually. I was on my way to a C5 and I pulled into the petrol station in Brisbane um, at Kenmore of all places and um, to fill up the car and I filled up my car and basically I turned around and this bike came in, this guy on a bike in black leather. Anyway, he got off his bike and I was just filling up the last litres in the car and I turned around and he was taking his helmet off and before he took his helmet off I noticed how skinny he was. I mean seriously, I've never seen anyone with such skinny legs, skinny body, skinny arms. Yeah. And then when he took his helmet off, it was, it was like Lord Voldemort emerged. It was, um, but it was funny because there were people milling around and no one could see it, but I no could. One noticed, noticed, yeah. Yeah, no one noticed, but I could. So I just kept filling up my car, smiling at him and um, checking him out, as you do, when you, when you can actually <laughs> see these things, you know. And it was funny because he kind of looked at me and then he kind of, um, I think he tried to make me not look. But I, because I've kind of trained myself now to just keep looking and because it, it's a normal thing that they do, they, they kind of throw you off. Um, and it got to the point where I just thought, well, I better stop. Or maybe I was being a bit rude, just staring anyway, you know. Yeah. So I kind of, um, but that's probably the only time in my many encounters that I've actually ever felt like a warning or anything. Apart from that, every other encounter, especially the one on Springbrook. Um, with the greys has been just wonderful. Real UFOs versus man-made UFOs. I mean, mm. I think Hollywood has a lot to answer for. Um, and I, um, I do have a bit of a theory when it comes to people that relate bad contact experiences. Um, I do believe that there are man-made kind of craft out there and I do believe that um, for some perverse reason um, some humans are taken and um, experimented upon. I don't know for what end but I think that type of experimentation is purely human-based. Um, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased, pleased you just said, said that, Sharon, Sharon because, because I've, I've been, been saying for years, years the, the ones you can photograph are ours and the ones you can't are theirs. And, and not, not everyone's, everyone's going to agree, agree with me, obviously. obviously. But I having a lived... craft that's not, it, you know, there's, there's, a, there's craft that looks like an organism. You know, when you look yeah. at something under a microscope, the way it joins together and it, it parts. And then yeah. there are craft that look metal, metallic. It's yeah. quite obvious what is, you know, to people like myself that Skywatch, it's very obvious to us which is which. The Wollongarra Jennings Dump. Do you know, it's, I've been on two dumb hunts in the last couple of years. The first, um, that's Deep Underground Military Base, by the way. Yep. Yeah. Um, the first one was at Wollongarra, um, which is on the border between, well, it's kind of Jennings is the New South Wales side, Wollongarra is the Queensland side, and yep, yep. Um, they have an underground base there, um, which I was told about um, by our armchair anarchist, who's um, one of the, the columns inside the magazine. Um, he's anonymous. Well, I should have probably said he. <laughs> He's, he is anonymous and um, he, he does a lot of research and um, so he sent me on this this uh, this quest to Wollongarra and I took a few friends a couple of years ago and I went back just recently. I had a road trip through New South Wales to spiritual high yeah. spots and we went back via Wollongarra because I wanted to take the, the lady with me who was a psychic medium through Wollongarra to see what she was picking up and... Um, Oh my gosh, she, um, I took her to something I found a couple of years ago, which was this roadway, which had a, a, a number of empty warehouse-like structures. There was absolutely nothing inside it. And in the last two years, I've actually closed off the road, so you can't even drive down there anymore, which is, um, yeah. which isn't, which isn't a good sign. But right at the start of that, there's a, there was this, this kind of telecommunications post in the middle of a field, in the middle of nowhere. Like you, like 
there wasn't even a building within um i don't know a kilometer of it it was just there and um the what she was picking up she basically um started to get severe pains in her lower back and in her legs um like she was being electrified yeah yep. so we basically had to get out of um Wollongarra very quickly so she could recover so I'm um, I'm pretty sure now after the initial investigation back in 2013 and with the recent visit um, that there is definitely a, an underground base there the Blue Mountains dumb In May last year, I was in the Blue Mountains in Katoomba, and that's supposedly the home of our largest underground base. And I had the pleasure um, earlier in October last year too of interviewing Rex and Heather Gilroy, who are cryptozoologists in the area. Wonderful couple. Yep. Have you heard of Rex Gilroy? No, no I, I haven't, haven't actually. actually. Yeah, I'm, I've just interviewed him, and I've just popped up on you on our YouTube channel uh, my interview with I'll him have about to go and have a look. yeah the Australian yow it's quite long it took me like it took almost seven hours to upload the video so it's about an hour mm. and a bit. it's quite long <laughs> I didn't realize how long that would take um, but anyway it's quite intense he talks about um, his experiences with interdimensional um, creatures as well it's a part of it yep. is, if you're into interdimensional beings um you'll really enjoy that um i will, I will yeah. yeah but he's also he wrote a book called blue mountains triangle and in that book he he details uh, an underground base which is supposedly the second largest in the world there's dolce in in new mexico i believe and um there's the yeah. blue mountain space which is the second largest and um so we went on a, a bit of a dumb hunt there but um They've actually, the, well, the military have closed off the, the area, so you can't even get close to the base. Um, yes. Yeah. But we're able to view where the, the, the craft come out of the mountain, and that was um, yeah. quite interesting. We did a bit of a day watch there. The ultimate C5 experience at Uluru. From a CE5 perspective, Uluru would be the ultimate place to do a CE5, um, for me anyway, because um, I can just, I, I found um, the most contact I've had is usually one, if I'm with a small group of dedicated meditators, and if we're yeah, on yeah. Aboriginal land um, or sacred land, we get we, the activities off the scale. We are, uh, a lot of the activity, um, I've photographed or anomalies has been at Lyle Deer Sanctuary in Brisbane, which is on Mount yep. Sampson, and it's in the Cooper Pidden. I think oh, I don't know if I pronounce that correctly. The um, Aboriginal ground there, and um, we've had some amazing activities there. That's where we've captured everything from you know creatures in the bush, elementals, through to craft, yep. um, and we've actually had visitation. Well, that's all for our podcast. Thanks for listening. And remember, if you want to support what we do, then share, subscribe, and leave a positive review over on iTunes for the open-minded skeptic. My team and I look forward to entertaining you once again in our next podcast. To check when our next podcast is, simply head over to www.tomspod.com. That's www.tomspod.com.